So for those of you that are visiting today, Chad and I are in the middle, not really in the middle, coming toward the end of a series that we have been preaching together about showing mercy to the poor and the needy and how our church can become more directly involved in such a ministry. This is actually message number 13, and uh, we have two left after this one. So uh, we're very much coming to the close of these things. And the last message in this series was preached by Chad, and it was about basically mercy, I think mercy for the Hannibal area is what we were calling it, at least as a tentative title. And the goal of that message was to discuss matters of serving the poor and the needy, which are more specific to our church, sort of taking the, uh, you know, all the general details we've been discussing and ask, you know, what is, how do we do that here? What are some options? What are some challenges for us in particular? And his message was working through those things. In today's sermon, I'm going to move back and do more general matters. Both this message and my next message will be composed of miscellanea, which is just a fancy word that means other stuff. Uh, it just There are some things here toward the end that just didn't fit anywhere else. And so in this message and the next message, they're just going to be lumped together into uh, these two messages. Now, although today's message is composed of miscellanea, I found myself consistently returning to a single passage of Scripture relevant to the matters I wanted to discuss today. And that passage is the one where I had you turn earlier. Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42, specifically verse 42, is the one that I want to read here and which will be the basis for all the things I want to say today. Now, this passage begins with Jesus' teachings on a topic which seems far removed from mercy to the poor and the needy, but then he ends with that very topic. So they are more related than you might think. Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And at first it may be strange to think that Jesus would consider giving and loaning to be related to violence, litigation, and coercion, which is what the first several verses of that passage talk about. Very often in Bibles where they have subject headings, usually the heading there is something like non-retaliation or uh, something like that. But then he ends with something very different about giving and loaning money. However, even if we may never connect those topics in our minds, we very much often connect them with our hearts. That is to say, the way we feel about these things very often puts them in the same category as violence, litigation, and coercion. I sure hope everything goes well back there after all the uh, screaming is over. Just wanted to acknowledge the fact I do hear that. Uh, I'm not deaf to the cries of those in distress. Uh, anyway, so yeah, in our minds, yeah, these things are very different, but in our hearts, they're very often united. A request for money very often seems to us just as unbearable as someone punching us in the face or stripping us naked. It puts us in the situation where we're just like, oh, like I don't, I don't want to be here doing this. You know, someone is asking you for money in this way. Makes us feel very uncomfortable. Makes us feel like we've been wronged perhaps in some way, that this person is now encroaching upon us like this. And so Jesus moves seamlessly from one form of intrusion into another and all the while exhorts us to live lives of graciousness to all people, whether they hit us in the faces or in our bank accounts. And that, I think, is why he moves from one into the other. All of these are some form of imposition, and we are supposed to respond with grace to these people. Now, as I said earlier, this one teaching from Jesus supports everything I plan to say in this message. So I found, to my delight, that some of these miscellaneous matters actually did connect and they connect here in this verse, verse 42 of Matthew chapter 5. So I've titled this message, Mercy Through Giving and Loaning, just to connect it more, 
more specifically with this verse here in Matthew. And I have three topics for you to consider, which are all somewhat related to each other. So first, uh, we have reason to help random beggars. And I will define what I mean by a random beggar when I get there, although I think that's pretty clear. Secondly, we should consider being generous to all needy people and not only people who are willing to change. And then finally, my third division for my outline today, loaning money is sometimes a good idea. So those are the three topics that all connect somewhat to this verse here in Matthew. Now to hold you in suspense for the whole sermon and keep you focused, um, I'm going to read you the beginning of a story that I will not finish until the end of this sermon. So I'm going to give you a reason to stay focused as you uh, listen to me teach today. This is from the life of Dan Smith. Dan Smith, for those of you who don't know, or Daniel Smith, was a missionary in China right before the communists took over, and then he went and served in other places. But uh, Dan Smith, his autobiography, Pilgrim of the Heavenly Way, is a book published by Granite Ministries, of course. And uh, this book here has a story in it that I thought was actually pretty instructive for everything I want to say today. So this begins with Dan Smith as a younger man and a dinner guest in the house of a man named Mr. Hogben. So that's sort of the setting here where there's kind of this dinner party going on or people over for dinner. And then there's a bit of an interruption. So I'll start reading here. It says there, there had been a bit of a uh, spat going on between some of the people. It said the knock on the door relieved the tension. There's a man at the door, Mr. Hogben, announced the maid, and I think he looks like a beggar. Daniel, called Mr. Hogben to me, you're Scottish, you go. We can trust you to be careful in your giving. So the Scottish have a tendency to be stingy, if you didn't know that. Um, so you can, we can trust you to be careful in your giving. I'll pay you when you return. He was probably thinking in terms of a three pence. So the man at the door was just a little older than I. These were days of industrial depression in England, and this fellow, coming from a shipbuilding area, had not had a job since he left school. He was down and out, as we say. He seemed to epitomize the sorrow and calamity which dogs the footsteps of unemployed men and the bitterness and frustration which attends so much human endeavor. The world to him was a world of tragic despair. He was beaten to his knees. I have always believed that God can work for a man when he comes to that realization and is never able to do much for any man until he does. My heart went out to him. I'm going to end the story there, leave you on the doorstep where Dan Smith has met this uh, kind of drifter type there. And I'm going to leave him there until we get back to the end of the sermon. And then I will resume that story and show you how things turned out. And that I think will be very uh, illustrative of things I want to say today. So let's go through the three points of my outline as I lay them out for you, starting with the first one, that Jesus gives us reason to help random beggars. Now these random beggars, that's just my word for them. I don't know what else to call them. These are the people that you see as you drive around town, people who hold signs saying anything helps, God bless. Those kind of people, or maybe they do knock on your door at some point, but most of the time it's just out there at some busy intersection, you know, asking for help. Maybe they ask you for spare change as you're getting into your car after grocery shopping. You can meet them any number of places, but the idea is they are begging for money and they just kind of come out of nowhere. You're not expecting them. You don't know this person, but boom, there they are right in front of you. Now, as we seek to show love to all people and testify to Christ, the random beggar presents us with challenges that we have not covered so far in this series. I don't think Chad or I, either of us, have actually uh, directly addressed this kind of person so far. I'm sure you've noticed that the drive of this series has been toward a consistent, even relational approach to helping the poor. That is being a part of their lives, trying to befriend them really, getting them to partner in their own betterment, so to speak, and also, all the while, seeking to lead them to Christ. However, we have not at all treated a topic which seems much more relevant to our current day-to-day -day lives, and that is random encounters with beggars. I think if you search your own experience, 
most of the time you've encountered a poor person has probably been while driving around or walking around and meeting these people who randomly are asking for money. I think that's probably how it goes with most of us, so that makes that question, how to deal with those people, much more relevant. And you might be wondering, how does the material of this sermon series apply to the random beggar? Or you might be wondering, can we apply these teachings at all to these sorts of people who are randomly begging for money? Does this stuff we've been talking about have any relevance to that kind of situation? After all, we're trying to help without hurting to apply to appeal to the, uh, the title of the book that Chad and I both read and really appreciate uh, how to help without hurting. And uh, how can we be sure to do that to a person that we're probably not ever going to see again? Most of the relational approach that we've been putting forward here is about getting to the real bottom of their troubles and giving them real solutions for their lives and helping them in their broken relationships, as we say, in all of that. But how can you do all of that to someone who is really just passing through town, maybe? Someone you're probably not going to encounter again. How can you be sure to help them without hurting them in the long run? I was always told something that, uh, I was told this by Christians, uh, by ministers even, that uh, you should never bother helping the random beggar at all because after all, he's just going to spend your money on beer and lotto tickets, right? Trying to either get rich quick or drown his sorrows in a bottle somewhere. And therefore, you're not supposed to help them. I mean, that was the advice I had for a good many years as a Christian among Christians. And, you know, certainly that's you know, maybe seems a little harsh, especially now after this sermon series, but it does raise the question, how, do you, how can you give to this person not being certain that that will not be the, the result? How can you be sure that you're actually helping them without further hurting them? So it's a very relevant question. How can we do this? How can we encounter this random beggar and help them in a way that is biblically sound? Well, to answer that question, we can start with Scripture. The Bible does give us some reasons to serve the random beggars in some way. And of course, as I sure you already guessed, here in Matthew 5, verse 42, this verse is very telling. He says, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Just in a principle stated generally, without exception, give to him who asks of you. The random beggar is certainly asking you for something. And Jesus says that we should give to him who asks of us. So there you see a general principle laid out, very relevant to how we deal with the random beggar. You're supposed to give. Furthermore, on this topic, there is a, another passage that is perhaps very well known, somewhat cryptic, and uh, maybe for that reason it has become a bit part of the general consciousness of our society if you read enough stories from people. Hebrews 13, verse 2, makes this statement. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. And then he just moves on from there to completely other matters and leaves you hanging with this idea, of just you know, be sure to entertain, to help strangers show hospitality to them, because some have entertained angels. And now moving on to the next part of my letter, and he just leaves you there. So... It's kind of a, a passage that makes you scratch your head, and probably much could be said about it. But the only thing I really want to say is you have there a very specific instruction to help strangers in some way. And to bear in mind, this person, you know, might be an angel. That's his reason for doing it. It's not very, you know, high on the ethical scale. It's just he might be an angel. You better be careful. It's, well, okay, fine. But the point is, help these people. There is actually reason to do so. So there's another passage that very often comes to mind as I think about this. There's something else that comes to my mind. It's not a specific passage of Scripture, but it is very much a biblical idea. And that is the final judgment. And this time in your life, your existence rather, when you are going to encounter God, and you are going to have to give an account of yourself to God for the deeds of your life. At the final judgment... We must answer everything God mentions. He is going to bring forth the events in our life and tell us to give an account of ourselves. Now, in all these encounters you have with random beggars, you're going to have to be giving an answer for your actions to God at some point. 
which tells me, being very pragmatic about all this, you should be preparing your answer in advance. Okay, this is important. This is the final judgment. As you think about your life generally, you should be getting ready for this. And that includes the time when you're driving around town and you see these beggars holding their signs asking for money. So, how will I answer God in that day when he asks me, well, what about this person? Why'd you, why'd you treat this situation in this way? Why did you do this? Well, I have my answer already planned. I imagine that God will say to me something like this, Stan, you gave all that money to those beggars and all they did with it was buy more beer. You know, how do you justify that? How do you justify yourself for wasting my money that I gave you in life? And then I will answer that question by saying, God, your son said to give to those who ask of me, so I did. It's like, I'm at least, if I'm going to be wrong, I'm going to pin it on a passage of scripture so I can at least make some kind of argument in the last day for why I did what I did. And I prefer that answer much more than the alternative answer. In the alternative, in that case, I give no money to random beggars ever. I just drive by. I ignore them completely. And then God says to me at the final judgment, Stan, I commanded you to show mercy to the poor, but you ignored all those people in the times of need. How do you justify that? And at that point, the only thing I could say is, well, God, at least no one ever swindled me. Which sounds really hollow compared to the other alternative, right? The one I gave you at the first. If I'm going to make a mistake here, if I'm going to blunder and throw away all this money that God has given me, you know, I'm going to err on the side of mercy rather than on the side of what we call good stewardship because one of those topics is actually mentioned in the Bible. Okay, and yes, I am kind of throwing down a gauntlet there. We talk about good stewardship a lot, but the Bible actually talks about mercy to the poor a lot. So much so that Chad and I have 15 messages talking about that. Okay, so if I'm going to err on the side of something, I'm going to err on the side of a major biblical theme, and I'm going to give money to these beggars. So that when God asks me why I did that, I can say, you told me to. And if he wants to nitpick on the particulars, he'll do so. But at least I'm going to err on the side of the Bible on this one. Now, there is some practical advice worth giving when coming to the topic of random beggars and how to help them. I want to keep this very simple because I don't consider myself an expert. I have encountered several beggars of this kind, and I have given money to quite a few of them. So I do know at least a few things, and I do want to share those. First, if possible, talk to him about his actual crisis. What is it that actually has him on this street corner at this time holding up this sign in this way? What is actually happening? He might be holding a sign that says anything helps, but he might actually have a very specific need that you can meet directly, in which case the much better thing to do is to meet that need directly. If you want to help him without hurting him, put your finger right on his exact problem and help him there. Even in this random encounter, there are ways to make sure that you can help in the most direct way possible if you will just ask questions. So give it a little more thought than just driving by and handing him money. Actually say, hey, you know, what's, what's the problem? You know, what has landed you out here? Take a few moments to talk with this person and discover the best way to help in that way. I remember one time, one of these guys I met, his specific problem was his vehicle had broken down, he knew exactly what part he needed, he knew how to fix it, he just didn't have the money. So I said, all right, well, how much you need? Here you go. And he got the part and fixed it up. There you go, very simple. If you take a few moments to, moments to ask a few questions, you can help these people very directly in a way that is gonna be very useful to them. So try to talk to them about their actual crisis and figure out what's going on. My second piece of advice is perhaps even more practical than that, and that is simply to always have cash with you for these occasions when you're going to encounter these kinds of people. Now, these encounters with the random beggar will not always end in giving him cash. There are other things you might do. I know some Christians that carry gift cards and things like that that they might also use, and there are ways to do those kinds of things. Cash, however, is very often more versatile and it's easy to have on you. And there's a lot to say for just having money on you that you can just give in that way. Because if you don't have it, you can't give it. 
And if you can't give it, you cannot fulfill this command that Jesus gives us about giving to those who ask of you. So make the effort to actually reserve some cash in your wallet or in your purse so that as you're driving around or walking around, you actually can give. There are plenty of times years ago when I just didn't have anything to give and therefore couldn't give. I eventually got tired of that and decided, you know what, how about I just carry cash? Like, okay, well, I'll just carry cash from now on. And therefore, you're able to actually meet those needs when you meet them. Furthermore, I will also say, and this is advice, mind you, I don't have a strictly biblical command for this. I'm just going to appeal to broader biblical principles. I advise that you make it a substantial amount of cash, you know, more than just your pocket change. Make it something that is worthy, wor that is worth giving here. And I say that because I want these beggars that you meet to remember these Christians that he meets as the most generous people he has ever met. I want them to remember us in that way. I want them to realize that these Christians actually care and they're actually very generous. Because after all, God has given generously to us and therefore it is right for us to imitate God in that way. One of the earliest messages in this series was on imitating God in his mercy. So therefore, as God has given generously to us, let's learn to give generously to other people, even if it's just the random beggar, give him a sizable amount of cash. I'm not gonna put a dollar figure amount on that, but make it something worth giving. And then finally, I do have another piece of advice here on the topic of giving cash. And this is my uh, intensely practical, somewhat paranoid way of dealing with things, but it is based on stories I have heard so I'm going to give it. I recommend keeping the cash that you're going to be giving separate from your wallet or maybe even your purse. I know for women that could be a little more difficult, but keeping it separate from your other stuff, you know, like your main wallet or whatever, because this does happen. You know, someone asks you for money and you go to pull out your wallet and give it to him. What happens? He's actually a thief and he just takes your wallet and runs. It does happen. It is something that does happen. I've never had it happen to me in all the times that I've actually given to a beggar. So there's no need to be at like DEFCOM 5 about all this, but it does happen. So it helps to actually carry the cash separately so that as you take that out, and if he, if he steals all that, fine, you're gonna give it to him anyway, right? But at least he didn't get your credit cards and stuff. Just a very practical piece of advice. I don't mean you to be super suspicious about it, but based on things I've heard, I think that's wise. Jesus also has that statement about being wise as serpents while you're being harmless as a dove. That's my point. Put some thought into this, carry cash, carry it separately, just in case. But don't let fear or anything like that keep you from giving. Don't let it keep you from your compassion because Christ has told us very specifically we're supposed to give to those who ask of us and not turn away from them. So let's make sure we're making that a priority. As you encounter these random beggars, remember, yes, they are worthy of your help because of biblical commands and you should be making the effort to do that as you meet them. So there are reasons for that, even though it doesn't really fall into the other things that Chad and I are saying in this series, it is a very real thing that we can do to help the poor. And as my first application of this very brief statement from Jesus, I'm gonna move on to my second one now. And my second point here is that we should be generous to all needy people and not only those people who are willing to change. Now, this part of my sermon is meant to answer a question, and that is, should we give to needy people who only desire a handout? You know, their, their great goal in talking to you is just to get a little more money at this time to make it through their day or their week. That's all they want. They don't want anything else. They especially don't want any of your Jesus talk. They just want a little bit of money. Now in this series, Chad and I have presented a lifestyle of helping the needy, founded upon an attitude of genuine love, expressed by walking with the needy in their lives as a friend and a guide for as long as they need that. Okay, that's been our main paradigm here in doing this. Now Chad and I are convinced that this kind of life will do the most good for the poor, perhaps even for the greater goal of expanding the kingdom of God. We do believe that actually entering into the lives of the poor, not only with the gospel, but with practical help, because those two things are united, as we've been trying to convince you, 
doing all of that actually is the best for the people and best for the kingdom of God. And Chad and I expect that if we ever do actually do that as a church, we will see God's example of mercy, not just in financial terms, not just in physical terms, but even in spiritual terms. However, all of our efforts depend upon one condition, a condition which we ourselves cannot control. There's something here that's beyond us that we can't make happen. And that condition is the needy must be willing to have us as their friends, willing to hear our counsel and open-hearted to truth. You know, they actually have to want this thing. You know. A man changed against his will is of the same opinion still. You can lead a horse to water, can't make him drink. All those things apply here. All those sayings about someone needing to be willing, that's true here too. You can't help these people in the way that we're describing if they frankly don't want that. So inevitably, we're going to encounter many, many poor people who only want the handout because there are a lot of them like that. They've kind of trained themselves to be that way. To a large degree, that's probably all they've ever known, right? Just walking around trying to get money, and uh, that's all it is. When we meet these people, we might be tempted to withhold what little mercy they are willing to receive, whether out of disdain for their complacency or perhaps because we're afraid of hurting them by encouraging that lifestyle. That is a very real threat now that we have these ideas in our heads about how to really help the poor. We might take those ideas and apply them in such a way that it might make us somewhat stingy toward those that don't really want the whole thing. They don't really want the gospel. They don't want the life-changing power of the gospel. They don't want the wisdom that comes from God's word that could actually help them in their lives. They don't want that. And because they don't want that, we might not want anything to do with them. We might disdain them in that way. Or we might just be so crippled about how to help them that we don't do anything at all. So we have a question to answer. Should we help these kinds of people? Should we help the needy who only want the handout? Well, Jesus has answered that question for us once again in this statement he makes in Matthew 5. Give to those who ask of you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Right? He, get, he again gives that statement without any exceptions and just expects you to act on it. Now, perhaps we could draw upon other scriptures to prove exceptions to this rule given by Jesus. And I can think of some of those scriptures, and we've talked about some of them in this series. My point is, when Jesus talks about this here and now in Matthew 5, he doesn't give any of those exceptions. He just gives you this general rule as though it were absolute. A simple, unconditional statement by which Jesus intends us to have our default response as giving. You know, if he had meant all of those exceptions to be in your mind at all times, he would have given exceptions when he said this. But he didn't do that. He just said, give to those who ask of you. And he left it there. And remember, Jesus places this command with other commands about people hitting you in the face and taking the shirt from your back, right? It's a very aggressive kind of thing. No poor person makes you feel more wronged than the poor person who stays poor, right? The person that never gets any better, keeps asking you for money. That person makes you feel like you've really been encumbrenced by them. You know, they're just dead weight. Well, in that context, give to those who ask of you. Until you can make that biblical argument in the life of this particular person, until you can make that biblical argument to withhold mercy from this specific person for specific biblical reasons, your default setting is to give. That is what Jesus implies by the statement he makes in Matthew 5. Now, once again, I have some advice to help hopefully you know, make that a little more than just give. Three pieces of advice this time. Just again, more on the topic of this needy person who asks you for money, you're going to give to him, but he doesn't really want anything more than just the handout. I do have some advice on this, and again, this is just my advice. It's not, thus saith the Lord. It's just what I've learned from my experiences and what I've heard from other people. First, when attempting to share the gospel with the poor, and especially these types that you know, maybe not be fully willing, when attempting to share the gospel with the poor, I recommend waiting for sincerity. Okay, sincerity. And I'll define what I mean by that in a minute here. But when I say this, I'm thinking mostly of the random beggar again, whom you'll never see again, 
though uh, this could apply to other people that you encounter on a more regular basis. I don't mean it to be narrow. This advice could apply generally. But I do kind of have beggars in mind once again as I talk about this. And I know that when you meet such a person as that, whether he is the random beggar or someone that you meet on a more regular basis, I know that you want to introduce him to Christ immediately and as fully as possible so that he knows the gospel because after all, he could die at any time. Our, our days are all numbered. You never know how long he's going to live. You want him to know the one thing that he must know to safeguard his soul eternally. I know you want that, and it makes sense for you to want that. However, I advise that you only really bother with you know, the full gospel discussions like that if the beggar seems to be a sincere person. And by sincerity, I mean the opposite of manipulation. I really do. And again, not to indulge in stereotypes, but there are plenty of manipulative beggars out there. They really are. Beggars are manipulative. They kind of have to be that way based on the lifestyle they have. They have to find a way to get as much out of people as they can. And if a beggar like that hears you speaking like a Christian, guess what he's going to do? He's going to talk the talk just like you because in so doing, he thinks he's going to get money out of you. He'll tell you, and this is stuff that I have heard with my own ears as I have encountered such people. He'll tell you he has two Bibles in his backpack and he reads them both every day. Don't know why he has two, but he's got two of them apparently. He'll ask you where you go to church, and he'll promise to be there on Sunday at your service because, after all, you've helped him. I've never seen a single one of those people actually make good on that, that promise, but uh, they say it very often. You have people like that who are just manipulating you. In response to that, I recommend you help him out with his need, give him the money, and then just leave it, honestly, because there's not really much more you can do for a person who is like that in that frame of mind at that time. Jesus talks about not throwing your pearls before swine and uh, see here, do not throw your pearls before swine and do not give what is holy to the dogs lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That's Matthew 7 verse 6 by the way. So he talks about that. There's a time when you don't actually give truth to people because you know they're going to abuse it and you. There are times to follow that statement from Jesus as well. The gospel can only be considered by a heart which has been made ready by a sincere realization of its own evil. Manipulators don't have that kind of sincerity. Their whole life is putting forth this mask that is going to get in the way of any truth you're going to give them. You can't deal truthfully with a person whose whole life is falsehood. It just doesn't work. Now, sometimes you're going to meet poor people or beggars or whatever, who actually do have a real sense of sincerity about them. In the very least, they're asking you honestly for their help. They're speaking to you honestly. They're not just trying to squeeze you. They're not trying to hit all the right buttons to make you spew out more money. They're just asking for help. People like that who are very sincere, you can actually do more with them. You can actually talk to them about more than just money and how much of it they need right now you can actually have a gospel conversation with that person. I know it sounds like I'm maybe being stingy with ultimate truth here, but I'm just telling you from my experience, if a person is putting on airs and wearing this mask just trying to get more out of you, you're just not going to get very far with them talking to them about Jesus. They're just going to say, oh yeah, praise God, brother, you know, I'll be at your church this Sunday. And just, you're not getting anywhere with them. So, Wait for sincerity to come around. And there are people like that. There are poor people like that who are willing to hear more. For them, you can say a lot. You can do a lot. But for some people, they're just not going to let you in, really. I mean, they're going to look like they're talking to you, but they're just, they're just trying to get more out of you. There are people like that, and I think you should be aware of that. And don't try too hard on people that have a heart that is not ready for what you're trying to say. Now to that you might say, well, Stan, if that's the case, what's the good of giving them that little bit of money if you're not really doing much for their soul? It's a fair question. My answer to that is my second piece of advice. And that is, it might actually be a little bit of generosity out of you that causes them to have an interest in greater matters. If you can kind of play the long game here and lay aside the gospel for just a little bit 
and just help him in the way that he's ready to receive, you might actually get from there back to the gospel and greater matters and things like Chad and I have been talking about in this series. You have to remember the beggar and the poor person and all of them are very accustomed to be being treated like garbage, okay? You know, there's even a quote that we read from a poor person earlier in this series where she says that, you know, we are the garbage that everyone throws away. That's how they think of themselves. They think of themselves that way because that's how people treat them. But if you actually give to them and do so cheerfully and with an apparent interest in their lives, as well as you can convey that to them, that person might just feel a bit of curiosity as to why and how you care, right? It might actually get through to them and just like, hey, a lot of people just pass me by and don't give me anything. This person not only gave, but actually seems to care. Wonder why that is. And if this person is indeed someone who has been uh, one of the complacent poor, who is not really interested in anything more than just that day's handout, uh, your gift to that person and your manner of giving it could actually get them thinking along different lines. I might actually get them to realize there's more to just, you know, getting money. Maybe this person actually does care. I said earlier that you should be somewhat selective in your sharing of the gospel, but now I say you should also be strategic in the sharing of your money because you might not be able to sit down with that person right then and there and share the whole gospel with them and all that just because they're not ready for it. But in your kindness to them in that moment, you might be laying a foundation for something else. You might be provoking that person to thought as to why you are the way you are, why you care. And that could all eventually get around exactly to where you want to go. You might actually have a conversation with them about Christ. You might actually get to know them a little bit better. You might actually become a part of their life. You might be able to help them in real ways as you model Christ to them and lead them along in ways that are actually going to help them in the long run spiritually and physically. But all of that may have to start with just a little bit of limited giving. You know, they might only want the handout at that time. If you give it to them, it might actually lead to more. It could happen. God can bless those kinds of things. So my advice is be content in that moment to give what they're willing to receive and wait for God to bless it in ways that only he can make happen. Because very often it's going to take God working on that person's heart in a very specific way that takes time to make that person ready for the full gospel. Take them from complacent, poor, maybe even manipulative, to sincerity and realizing their need of help from God himself. Okay, third piece of advice here. <clears throat> you can be bolder in withholding your giving when you know that person better. All right. Again, I'm trying to impress upon you the idea that Jesus uh, gives this general rule, give to those who ask of you. That's to be your default setting. We know there are exceptions to that rule. There are times for those exceptions. And I'm saying you can be a bit bolder in saying no when you know that person a little bit better. If this person is a relative or a neighbor or a coworker or the beggar you see every single week at the gas station, we can be a little bit bolder in what we say to that person and maybe even deciding not to give. It takes some time to figure that out and experience with that person. This is especially true, I think, if the person has maybe made promises which he has broken, like, thanks for your help, I promise it's the last time, and it's never the last time. He says that over and over again, it just never is. You can use that broken promise with that person and say, look, Clearly, you have problems deeper than just needing money right here, right now. There are things in your life that are constantly wrong that need to change, and we need to deal with those. Me giving you more money is not going to help you any more than it did last week or the week before or the month before that or the year before that. You know, there's more at work here, and we need to actually do something real about this and not just keep giving you money. Or it could be anything. I mean, it could be any kind of person, any kind of scenario. If you can point to something in their life that you know is a problem that causes these long-standing you know, patterns of poverty, that's a good time for you to say, well, let's not just give money, let's actually fix the problem. Or if it's a person who you know is actually just lying to you and manipulating you, you can just say, look, I've tried to be generous with you, now you're just using me, I can't just keep giving you money like this because you're just abusing it. 
There are situations like that. We could probably list off dozens of them potentially. But there are times when you can say no. It just takes some time to get to know that. So again, exceptions to every rule, but the general principle that Jesus gives is give to those who ask of you. So even if this person is not really willing to change, maybe even on the manipulative side, there's still a general principle here that you often should follow about giving to them anyway. The exceptions are always exceptions. Okay, they're not the rule. Okay, all of that, there was kind of a lot packed into that one point about helping those who maybe you're not willing to change. I do think that's part of all this. You don't have to wait for the, uh, the guy who's always willing to hear everything you have to say. You can help them even if he's not totally there yet. All right, I have one final application of what Jesus says in Matthew 5. This is point three. This one takes a bit of a different turn. This is about loaning. And the point I have to make is that loaning money is sometimes a good idea, which is strange when you're talking about the poor, but it really is here in this passage. Now, just to acknowledge something that's right here up front, Proverbs 22.7. I don't know if we've actually used this passage at all in the series. I can't remember. But it says that the borrower is the slave of the lender, right? The borrower is the slave to the lender. Now, Chad and I have stated constantly that we want the poor to be independent of us even as we help them. We don't want these paternalistic ideas. We don't want to give ourselves a God complex in which we become their savior. We don't want any of that. We want them to be in some sense standing on their own, <clears throat> standing on their own and learning how to better stand on their own so that they don't always need us. But the borrower is the slave of the lender, which raises the question, why would you loan this person money? You know, why would you loan someone money rather than just giving it to them if that is going to, in some sense, make them your slave? Why would you do that? So it seems like the kind of thing that you would never do if you really want to help the poor. You would never just loan him money. However, Jesus says in Matthew 5, give to those who ask of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. He actually says the word borrow, which implies that you are loaning him money rather than just giving him money, which is really strange, but it is there. Jesus has talked about this. Now, on the one hand, a loan can be a bad idea. You know, we talked about the borrower being the slave to the lender and all that. Also, loaning money can put a strain on the relationship. You know, I once was given the advice that uh, you should only loan money to someone you never want to see again because when you do that, you know, they're going to be very uncomfortable around you. They're not going to want to see you anymore, especially if they can't pay you back. And uh, if you actually loan money to them, you get them out of your life. So you actually win. You had to spend money to get it to happen, but hey, you got rid of an annoying person, right? Somewhat shrewd, sarcastic advice there, but it has some real truth to it. You loan money to a person, if they can't pay it back, it does put a bit of a strain on the relationship there, and your friendship could be jeopardized with this person. However, the point I want you to see here is that sometimes loaning money can be a very good idea and can actually help the poor in ways that he would not otherwise have. And specifically, it teaches the poor how to borrow and repay in safety. Stressing the word safety here. Because at some point in their lives, they probably will need to borrow money and they will need to learn how to repay it. The way our society works, it's very hard to do anything without you know, getting a loan of some kind. It's just the way our society works. We carry credit cards, which are basically operating on that same principle, right? This is part of our society. And poor people usually have a very bad track record with that sort of thing. You know, they just cannot handle the whole you know, borrowing money, paying it back, they usually get deeper and deeper in the hole. They need to be taught how to actually do this. Now, they're going to have two scenarios that could play out for them, and one of them is bad and one of them is good. The one scenario is when they need to borrow money, they get it from the usurer, you know, to use the good old-fashioned word. These are people who loan money at very high interest rates so they can just totally fleece people. 
And in our day, the usurers are very much the cash title places and the payday loan stuff and all that kind of thing. Poor people use those businesses a lot, if you want to call them businesses, more like traps. Um, they use those kinds of places a lot, and they just get deeper and deeper in debt, and they're never going to get out of it. But the thing is, they go to those places because if they need money quick, that's usually the only place they can get it. The alternative is if they know you and they know you are not going to try to take them for everything they have, what little they have, you can actually loan money to them, no interest, because the Bible says you can't loan uh, money at interest to poor people. Chad talked about that. You can loan money to them in safety, and you can work with them on how to pay it back. They can actually do this between friends, you know, with a person who is not trying to destroy them. That is a lot better alternative, a much better alternative to going to the usurer in town, okay? So that's the point I'm trying to make here. You can actually do this in a way that helps them. If they uh, need help learning how to deal with loans and paying them back, you can actually help them do that. You can teach them how it, what, it, what goes into paying back a loan because they're gonna need a lot of help on that. So that's my last piece of advice for today when it comes to deal with, dealing with the poor asking you for money. Ask yourself, if a loan might be a good idea. I think it's especially easy when they themselves have asked to borrow money because then they're open to the idea of actually paying it back. Now that can go south, but if you know this person well enough to think they might actually be able to do it and you might actually be able to help them learn how to pay back that loan eventually, you can do that. It'll build in them a kind of discipline that they need as they deal with other people in the world. Now, there are sometimes you're not going to want to do that if you know this person is just not going to pay you back. Make it a gift. Forget about it. You know, there's very much a call for that. But ask yourself, first of all, would a loan be better here? Would this teach this person something they need to know? You know would this be the best scenario for them? It is a possibility. Based on what Jesus said, we should have that in our minds about loaning them money and them borrowing from us. All right, so as you can see, this message was very much miscellaneous. Even my pieces of advice were kind of here and there as I was trying to group them together. But very much coming back to that command given by Jesus about giving to those who ask from us and not turning away from people who want to borrow from us. Now, <clears throat> I want to resume the story that I began earlier from the life of Dan Smith and finish it here because... As it turns out, this story, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is failing me here. This story actually does a lot to illustrate most of my major points today. So if you want to hear this from a Christian that you might respect more than me, uh, you're going to get this from the life of Daniel Smith, right? So here we go. Let's resume right where we picked up. You remember he was, the beggar came to the door. They were at this dinner party. Dan Smith was sent to go answer because it was expected that he'd be, uh, well, a little more miserly because he's Scottish. He's talking with this guy on the doorstep. Let's pick up where we left off here. So this is Dan Smith talking to this beggar. Have you ever read anything in God's book, the Bible? I asked. I have a New Testament here in my pocket, he answered, plunging into his inside breast pocket for it. My mother gave it to me when she passed away and asked me to read it every day. I haven't done that but I do remember some things from Sunday school days. Do you mind if I read something to you? I asked. Certainly not. He seemed glad that I would. I read the story of the prodigal son in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and verses 11 to 24. I then explained that the father loved his son very much, but the son thought he could manage without his father, so he turned his back and went off. But it wasn't long before he was in the far country and in the swill of the swine trough. Now you see, I went on, the father could not do a thing for his son while in the far country. But as soon as he came back home, the father fed him, clothed him, and killed the fatted calf for him. And I ask you to come back to God like that, and come because God's beloved son has made a way for you to come back through his sacrificial death upon the cross. He himself is the way. Will you come? giving very much an evangelistic pitch there. And Dan Smith says, he came. We knelt together on the doormat upon which everyone wiped their feet, 
but it was holy ground in that moment, and he was born of God. He knew it, and I knew it. I had a shilling and a sixpence as the sum total of my wealth. I held them out to him, the shilling in one palm and the sixpence in the other. That's all I have. Take your pick. He took the bigger one, the shilling, double the value of the sixpence, and he went off. Well, Daniel, how much did it cost me? Asked Mr. Hogbin upon my return. A shilling, sir. A shilling? He thought it was too much. Everybody howled, but Mr. Hogbin refunded me, and all of them, of course, were a bit skeptical about the salvation story. The following week, at exactly the same time, again, there was a knock at the door. So one week later, once more, the maid announced the presence of a man. I'm not sure, Mr. Hogbin, she said, but it looks like the man who was here last week, but maybe not. Daniel, called Mr. Hogbin, you go, but listen carefully. You pay yourself this time. It's all your business. Okay, it was indeed the same man, and yet not the same. He was clean and tidy. There was a light in his eye and a joy upon his face. The Lord had made him something other than what he was. Brother, he began, I've come to bring the shilling back. He told me how he had gone to a Doss house that night, and before retiring, he knelt in prayer and asked the Lord to lead and guide him in this new life. And would you believe it, he cried. The first man I asked for a job on Monday morning had me start right away, and I've had my first pay packet, and I wanted you to have your shilling back. We knelt on the doormat again and gave God thanks. Well, Daniel, inquired Mr. Hogbin upon my returning to the dining hall, how much did it cost you? Sir, I cried jubilantly, he came to give the shilling back, and it is my shilling. <laughs> <clears throat> So that was Daniel Smith's experience with that one particular beggar. Now, I like that story, and I thought about it as I was preparing this message because it illustrates many of the main points that I was really trying to make in this sermon. First of all, you do see Smith there give to a random beggar. This guy just shows up at the door. Dan Smith doesn't expect to ever see this guy ever again. He just, he's going to send him on his way by the time this is over, but he still gives to him. You know, give to those who ask of you. Secondly, Smith did not wait to see if the man's conversation, or the man's conversion rather, he did not wait to see if the man's conversion was genuine before giving, but he just gave generously. He handed out two options, he let the man take the bigger coin, and just left it at that. He gave generously without waiting to see if this guy was really serious. He could have been manipulating him, he could have been just talking the talk to get more money out of him. But Dan Smith didn't wait to see if that was true, he just gave him the money and said, God bless. Finally, although Dan Smith did not intend to loan him the money, that is effectively what happened. The man brought the shilling back, right? So, I mean, there you see it. I mean, sometimes loaning the money actually works. Here is a guy, Dan Smith had no reason to think this guy was going to be able to pay him back. I mean, he's just giving out a shilling here. But that guy comes and pays him back anyway. So, it's not nearly as dangerous or as weird as you might think of it. It actually happened, practically speaking, in the case of Dan Smith there. So all of those things there, I just read that story because it illustrates many of the points I was trying to say. And again, the point here is just to take that statement from Jesus and apply it to these kinds of situations. Give to those who ask of you. Do not turn away from them, them who want to borrow from you. There is a real place for that in the life of, in the place of random beggars, in people that are not really willing to change immediately, and even in the case of loaning money. All right, well, that's all I have to say for today. Um, next time when I teach again, I have another message full of even more scattered thoughts as we bring this series down to its close. And then after that, Chad has one more message, so we're two messages away from being finished with this topic, at least teaching about it, that is. Are there questions or comments or stories people want to share about experiences they have had? Those might be helpful. Um, anything people want to share at this time before we... Uh, close this part of our meeting.